Hello YouTube. Okay, um, today we're going to uh, look at some objections to moral non-naturalism. First, uh, I'll, I'll look at some objections to the open question argument, then we'll turn to objections to, to intuitionism more generally. Um, so, the open question argument, as we saw, says that for any definition D of the word good, it's always perfectly legitimate to say X is D, but is X good? That's an open question. The answer isn't decided by the meaning of the terms, which means that good doesn't mean D. Goodness is indefinable. It's a simple, unanalyzable property. Okay. First, one of the earliest objections to the open question argument is that it simply begs the question. Suppose that you're a subjectivist, so you hold that X is good means I approve of X. Well, according to Moore, this analysis fails because you can say perfectly legitimately I approve of X, but is X good? Well, now it seems that if you're a subjectivist, you could just uh, reject this claim. Um, you could say that actually I approve of X, but is X good is a closed question. That to ask this question is to imply that you don't really understand the meaning of the terms. So the, the concern is that the open question argument just presupposes that good can't be defined. It doesn't argue for it. You'll only, you'll only agree that a definition of good generates open questions if you already don't if you already reject the definition. I think Moore has a pretty plausible response to this. Uh, the important difference between definitions of goodness and other definitions is that definitions of goodness seem to produce open questions. Um, that's not in doubt. They certainly seem to be open. Now we just add the fact that you know that a question seems to be open is evidence that it is open. So in other words, this, the suggestion here is that instead of taking the argument to include uh, a bald assertion that, for instance, I approve of X, but is X good, is an open question, which would presuppose that goodness can't be defined this way, we take the argument like this. Uh, I approve of X, but is X good seems, on reflection, to be an open question. And the fact that this seems, on reflection, to be an open question is evidence that it is an open question. Now, I think we should we should grant that this doesn't prove that the question really is open. A question can seem open without really being open. Consider mathematical claims such as uh, 1,326 plus 896 equals 2,222, but does it equal 1,133 plus 1,089? That's not actually an open question. Assuming uh, standard arithmetic 1,133 plus 1,089 does equal uh, 1,326 plus 896, and it's not really intelligible to doubt that. The answer to that question is decided by the meaning of the terms. However, that question might seem open due to our cognitive limitations. Uh, we can certainly doubt whether those sums are the same, and that's what makes the question seem open. So. You know, we, we have to grant, I think, that just because a question seems open, it doesn't immediately follow that it is open. But, as I say, it does provide evidence that the question is open. And this is especially so with the case of goodness. Because a question like, I approve of X, but is X good, seems to be open even after we spend a lot of time reflecting on it. With the mathematical example, reflection will lead us to recognise that the question is closed. Uh, but definitions of goodness seem to generate open questions even after we spend time thinking about them. So I think we can take the open question argument um, as providing strong prima facie evidence that good is indefinable. A second objection to the open question argument is that two terms can refer to the same thing despite having different meanings. So the way Moore's argument works is he tries to show that the word good can't be defined. Uh, for any proposed definition D, the word good has a different meaning to D. And he thinks that this shows that goodness is a simple, irreducible property. So let's make this argumentative structure explicit. We have uh, premise one. For any purported definition D, the word good has a different meaning to D. Then we have a conclusion. Good does not refer to the same property as D. So goodness is a simple, irreducible property. We can't identify it with, with any other properties. Now obviously there's a premise missing here. This argument is not valid. 
The hidden premise must be something like, if two terms have different meanings, they don't refer to the same property. But that premise is false. Two words can mean different things, but still refer to the same thing. The classic example is, water is H2O. Water is H2O is uh, a perfectly acceptable definition, um, but the terms water and H2O don't mean the same thing. I mean, we had to discover that water was H2O. It's not that, uh, that people talking about water before the rise of modern science were referring to a completely different property to us. You know, they were talking about the same stuff as us. It's just we know that it's H2O and they didn't. So just because the term good has a different meaning to some proposed definition D, it doesn't follow that defining good in terms of D is wrong. Water doesn't mean H2O, but water is H2O. They're exactly the same property. Actually, just as an aside, I don't know why philosophers still use the water is H2O example, because in fact water isn't identical with H2O. Water also comes in the forms D2O, T2O, and HDO, various forms of heavy water. Maybe there are other forms too, but, um, you know, but anyway, I mean, you get the point, right? Assuming that water did just come in the form H2O, then uh, water is H2O would be a perfectly acceptable definition. Uh, again, I think this sort of objection is unpersuasive. Uh, the trouble is that we all agree, and all would have agreed even before the rise of modern science, that water is whatever it is that makes up that clear liquid that we drink and that we find in lakes and rivers and oceans. So then it's just a matter of empirically investigating um, you know, well, what does make up that liquid? Uh, we can discover that what we refer to as water is made up of the stuff we refer to as H2O. Uh, and since we agree that water is identical to whatever molecules constitute it, that counts as a discovery that water is H2O. But this kind of thing just doesn't work with goodness. Whereas with water, we can all agree with the statement water is identical with, the, with whatever molecules constitute it, no such statement holds for goodness. It's not that we all agree that goodness is identical with such and such, and it's just a matter of figuring out what such and such is. I mean, think about how we go about empirical investigation. How would we go about empirically identifying goodness with some other property? How would that investigation even start? I mean, uh, I guess at a minimum, first we'd have to agree on what particular acts are good. Um, you know, we'd have to agree on the particular actions that, are, that, that evince goodness, and then somehow we'd have to investigate what all of these acts have in common. Um, I mean, that's at minimum. But of course, determining what particular acts are good depends on having a prior conception of what goodness is. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's an obvious difference between the case of, of goodness and, and water, I think. Okay. A rather more serious objection is that the open question argument proves too much. The trouble is that it seems that we can apply to the open question argument to any interesting conceptual analysis. Consider knowledge. Philosophers have spent an extraordinary amount of time debating exactly what knowledge is. What conditions do we have to meet in order to have knowledge? Well, the classic answer is that knowledge is justified true belief. Knowledge is a complex property. We can break it down into its constituent parts, a belief which is justified and true. But notice that we can generate open questions about this analysis. John has justified true belief that P, but does John know that P? That's an open question. Another example is personal identity. Intuitively, I'm the same person I was yesterday. Many things about me will have changed since yesterday, but it seems that my personal identity is intact. If I'd robbed a bank yesterday, you'd still blame me for it today. I'm not a different person. So, what does personal identity consist in? What is it that makes me the same person today that I was yesterday? Again, all sorts of different answers to this question. One of the most famous comes from John Locke. For Locke, personal identity through time is a matter of psychological continuity. What makes me the same person I was yesterday is that my current psychological states evolve from my psychological states yesterday. I have memories connecting myself now to who I was yesterday, and so on. Again, this is very plausible, but notice that we can say John at 2015 has psychological continuity with John at 1990, but are John at 2015 and John at 1990 uh, the same person? That's an open question. I suspect that any 
analysis of any philosophically interesting concept will produce open questions. If the question, is an x a y, is closed, then analysing x in terms of y would just be like giving a dictionary definition, like saying bachelors are unmarried men. So either the open question argument doesn't show that good is unanalyzable, or it shows that conceptual analysis in general is misguided. I'm assuming that most philosophers would find that conclusion too strong. I think what the open question argument really does then is, is mark the distinction between interesting and uninteresting analyses. If a particular analysis generates open questions, such as John has justified true belief that P, but does John know that P, then it's interesting and informative. If it generates closed questions, such as John is a bachelor, but is he an unmarried man, then it's the sort of trivial definition you'd get in a dictionary. So I think that this is maybe a bit of a more, more troubling problem. Fourth, arguably the open question argument presupposes a, a view of concepts that's far too rigid. Here's an example from Hilary Putnam. The stereotypical lemon is yellow, sour, and with a certain kind of peel. If somebody asks you, what is a lemon, you'll probably describe it in those kind of terms. That's a normal lemon. You know, imagine a lemon that's, that's, that's yellow, sour, certain kind of peel, that, that's a stereotypical paradigm lemon. However, there's no set limit to how much we can revise our concepts. So Putnam suggests, you know, suppose we were to discover that most lemons are actually blue. We discover that there are <coughs> we discover that there are lemons growing underground in places we'd never looked. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cough. <coughs> Tickle in my throat. I had a slight cold for a long time. Um so <coughs> <coughs> Putnam suggests, suppose you were to discover that most lemons are actually blue. We discover that there are lemons growing underground in places we'd never looked. What would happen in this case is that we'd simply revise our concept of lemons. Concepts can be revised, and there's no sort of necessary limit to how much they can be revised. Philosophers often revise concepts. Uh, think about a more philosophical concept like knowledge again. Philosophers try to come up with... <coughs> with a precise definition of knowledge. But notice that this isn't simply a descriptive project. In ordinary language, the, the word knowledge is used in all sorts of different ways. And when we try to define knowledge, we're not necessarily trying to capture all of the many different uses. We, we have to ask, what would be a good definition? What would be a useful definition? And then whatever definition we come up with, you know, it's going to turn out that some colloquial uses will be excluded. So, to an extent, philosophers aren't just doing conceptual analysis, they're doing conceptual revision. They're saying, here's a better way to understand this concept. <coughs> so now consider a meta-ethical claim, such as subjectivism. X is good equals I approve of X. Similarly, this isn't just descriptive. Surely the subjectivists will agree that people can use statements like X is good in all sorts of different ways. Um, you know, for different people, good refers to different things. Some people who say X is good means mean X is approved of by my God. Some people who say X is good mean X maximises pleasure, and so on. What the subjectivist is trying to do is elucidate the core meaning, or a uh, you know, meaning that makes the most sense of our general moral practice, or, or the meaning that fits best into our general world view, or whatever. For any concept, including knowledge and goodness, there will be all sorts of different variations on it, so it can be legitimately precisified in different ways. This explains why definitions of concepts produce open questions, and also why these open questions aren't necessarily a problem for the definition. Any time we try to precisify a concept, we're going to cut out some of the standard usage. That's what a precisification is. But naturally, that's going to produce open questions, because the, the sort of precisified concept is not going to be entirely in line with standard usage. Those were some objections to the open question argument. Uh, I think the attitude that most philosophers have these days to the open question argument is that it doesn't really work, at least not in the form that Moore originally uh, gave it. But nevertheless, there does seem to be an important idea in there. 
Um, good seems to resist definition in a way that even contentious words like knowledge don't. In his introduction to metaethics, Andrew Fisher suggests that what makes good so special is the fact that it has motivational force. If we think that something is good, this motivates us to some degree to do it. That's a central aspect of the notion of goodness. But when we try to define good in terms of non-moral properties, the motivational force seems to drain away. Uh, suppose you know, X is good means X maximises pleasure, or X is good means an ideal observer would approve of X. Well, it looks like you could agree that X maximises pleasure or that an ideal observer would approve of X without having the slightest motivation to do X. So maybe this captures what's, what makes goodness so different to other properties. OK, well, let's look at some problems for intuitionism. Um, I've just pointed out that perhaps the insight of Moore's argument lies in the way that goodness has motivational force. The question is, does moral non-naturalism account for the force of moral judgments. I think there are some reasons to suspect it doesn't. The trouble is that it makes moral value something totally unconnected to us. Rather than being deeply connected to human life, moral values sort of float around in the external world, passing their judgments independently of how any of us feel. Suppose we discover that there were that there are objective moral values, but that they're completely unlike what we were expecting. Imagine scientists to discover like a kind of like a kind of field that's just passing a moral judgment, you know, like a magnetic field, just, just you know, like a charge, I don't, I don't know, just some field passing a moral judgment. But this moral judgment is something really terrible, like, rape is good. Um, would this make any difference to our actions? I suspect it wouldn't. I think we'd just say, well, who cares what the objective moral value is? We don't want to go out and commit rape, and we don't want to live in a society where people go around raping each other. Um, Maybe that thought experiment is a bit silly, uh, but it seems to me that what really moves us uh, are not objective values, but rather our own subjective values. Once we say that morality is objective and mind independent, it seems to me to lose its motivational force, because motivation comes from within. Right, let's turn to some of the big ones, the big problems for intuitionism. Uh, there are two really big problems for intuitionism. I expect they're already obvious to you. So, second, um, there is a metaphysical problem. Non-natural moral values are just weird. I mean, they're weird in two respects. They're non-natural, so they're totally unlike the rest of the stuff in the world. Uh, and, and they're normative. Somehow the objective mind-independent world is passing judgments like you should not rape, you should not murder, and so on. Um, how can it be doing that? I guess this is basically Mackey's argument from queerness. But there's a particular problem with moral non-naturalism, which is how do we explain the relation between natural properties and moral properties? In particular, we saw that moral properties supervene on natural properties. There can be no change in the moral properties of an action without a change in its natural properties. As we saw, Maintaining supervenience is important. If we, allow the moral, if we allow moral properties to differ without a change in the natural properties, it becomes impossible to make any moral judgment at all. Moral values would float free in a realm all of their own. Um, imagine a world exactly the same as our world in all of its natural properties. There's an exact copy of Ted Bundy, who kills people for exactly the same reasons. But now suppose that this world differs in its moral properties. In this world, Ted Bundy's actions are morally good. I mean, clearly, the moral realists can't allow this. This, this is a possible world. Um, the, the natural properties must fix the moral properties. Otherwise, moral properties become far too sort of disconnected. I mean, in fact, it's barely even coherent, I think, to sort of imagine that, that all the natural properties could remain the same, but the moral properties differ. That's not, you know, that just doesn't make sense. Um... So the question is, how exactly does the moral non-naturalist explain this supervenience? Given that moral properties are totally different from natural properties, uh, how exactly is it that natural properties constrain moral properties in this way? What's the nature of that relation? So that's a big problem. Third, uh, the epistemology of intuitionism is seriously unattractive. How do we access moral truths? Oh, we know truths by intuition. 
I mean, that's a really unsatisfying answer. Why should we trust our intuitions? Uh, most intuitionists <clears throat> probably would appeal to a, a sort of general epistemic principle along the lines of um, this one suggested by Michael Humer, which he calls the principle of phenomenal conservatism. Um, and it goes something like this. Other things being equal, it is reasonable to assume that things are the way that they appear. Uh, there are many different kinds of appearances. Humour says that it's a broad category that includes perception, memory, introspection and intellection. Um, intellection, I think he just means intuition there. At the moment, based on what I can see, it seems to me that there's a computer in front of me. Based on what I can hear, it seems to me that there are birds flying outside. Maybe. I can't actually hear much at the moment. Um, but uh, based on my memory, it seems I, I went to the shop a few days ago. Uh, as an example of intellectual appearance, humour gives logical judgments. So of these two argument forms, if P then Q, P therefore Q, if P then Q, P therefore not Q, we just see that the first is valid and the second is invalid. And we see this with our minds, with our intellect. The principle of phenomenal conservatism just says that in the absence of evidence to the contrary, Things are how they, how they seem to be. We should trust that appearances accurately reflect the world. And this means we should trust our intuitions. If I have a very strong intuition that it's wrong to harm people for fun, I should provisionally accept that it's wrong to harm people for fun. Um, perhaps the intuitionist, uh, <clears throat> presumably the intuitionist, would need to add that appearances can have a different degree of force. It seems to me that there's... A blue, a blue car through the trees, but I could easily be wrong. Um, on the other hand, I'd need quite extraordinary evidence to come to believe that there's not a computer screen in front of me. Some moral judgments carry great force. Something like, it's wrong to harm people for fun, would be, would be one example. These are the kinds of judgments that the intuitionist would say that we know by intuition. There are some judgments that we're maybe not so sure about, but some moral judgments just have kind of very great power over us. It's wrong to harm people for fun is, you know, who's going to disagree with that, right? So we can, we, these are the sort of things we know by intuition. What happens if we reject the principle of phenomenal conservatism? Well, we end up with a, uh, a sort of wholesale global scepticism. All this principle says is that other things being equal, we can trust appearances. Now, if we reject this, if we don't trust appearances, we won't be able to get any kind of inquiry started. We, I mean, we have to trust that we're not being totally misled by perception and memory and so on, otherwise we just can't believe in anything. Uh, there is a computer in front of me. It's an object that you type things on and words come up on the screen. I don't need to give any evidence for that beyond, you know, I can see it, I can feel it. <clears throat> so I agree with humour that, that other things being equal, it's reasonable to assume that things are the way they appear. I think the main problem with Hume's, Hume's argument is that with intuition, other things aren't equal. There are there are good reasons to be sceptical of intuition that don't apply to perception. So let's think about some of these reasons. First, there's widespread disagreement about moral intuitions in a way that there doesn't seem to be with perception. Let's say you get people from England, people from China, people from the Kung Bushman tribe, to watch a video of a car driving into a wall. Well, they'll all see pretty much the same thing. Maybe the Kung Bushman wouldn't know what a car was, so they wouldn't be able to call it a car, but they'd see an object moving at high speed into a wall. There's widespread agreement about our basic perceptual judgments. And this simply isn't the case with moral intuitions. I think I've mentioned before how you know, different societies have different attitudes to infanticide. In many small-scale societies, infanticide is widely practiced. Obviously, we'd consider that morally repugnant. In general, it's, it's pretty easy to find examples of, of widespread moral variation. This poses a particular problem to intuitionists. Moral knowledge is fundamentally based on intuition, but how can we know that our intuitions are the right ones? Um, the main response uh, for the intuitionist is going to be that despite appearances uh, we have basic basic moral values that that don't vary. Moral systems end up being different because these basic values get applied in different ways. Um, and I guess there are two main ways this can happen. First, moral systems can also be influenced by your non-moral beliefs. 
In the past, it was widely held that animals are not conscious, they're mere automata, unfeeling robots. You know, they seem to shriek in pain when you stab them, but really their shrieks are nothing more than mechanical reactions. This led to people performing all sorts of very horrible experiments on animals, which today we would find unacceptable. The difference here is arguably not a difference in moral value, but a difference in non-moral belief. We all agree that causing extreme pain without good reason is wrong. We believe that animals feel pain, but the scientists of the past didn't. So, similarly, uh, things like you know discrimination against blacks, discrimination against women, was often based on non-moral claims. Claims like, blacks are more prone to violence, women are less rational, and so on. Second, different moral systems arise out of different practical pressures. The reason why infanticide is practiced in many societies is because of the living conditions in those societies. Uh, the environment is difficult, resources are scarce, population levels need to be kept down. But there's no reliable contraceptive methods, so infanticide looks like the only option. In fact, even uh, abstinence from sex wouldn't have been an option in some places, because in some societies, such as the Tiwi of the Bathurst and Melville Islands, uh, they were not aware that pregnancy caused was caused by sex. I don't find this kind of answer very persuasive. It's true that some moral differences are caused by non-moral differences, but this is implausible in many cases. I mean, just think today, for instance, about how many people today are perfectly aware, for instance, that animals feel pain but just you know, don't care. They don't think we should extend moral value to them. Consider how one of the highest virtues of ancient Greek and Roman people was courage in the face of violent death. Consider differences in attitudes to punishment. In the past, wrongdoers would be tortured, burned to the stake, have their limbs cut off. And often that would be done as a public spectacle that everybody could enjoy. So what non-moral beliefs differ in these cases? Um, this just looks like a straightforward example of different moral value. With the example of infanticide, uh, Jesse Prince points out that in, in many small-scale societies, infanticide just isn't a big deal. So it's not that it's like a necessary evil, like, oh no, you know, this is terrible, we, we have to kill this child. It just isn't evil. Uh, on the other hand, if somebody from our culture had to kill their own child, they would see that as being a kind of awful and devastating moral dilemma. Even if killing the child is the right thing to do, they'd probably live with the guilt for the rest of their lives. Um, in any case, I suspect there's plenty of people in our culture who'd say that parents should never kill their infant children, no matter how bad the circumstances get. You do whatever you can to keep them alive. So, at best, the, uh, the appeal to different social conditions, maybe that explains why our moral values are different, but it certainly doesn't show that they're really the same. Uh, so I think that moral disagreement does suggest that moral intuition is questionable in a way that perception isn't. A second problem is nobody knows how intuitions work. Nobody knows how they could give us access to the facts. With perception, we have good accounts of how various modalities connect us up to the world. In fact, even before the development of modern scientific understanding of, for instance, the visual system, everybody knew that we get images of the world through our eyes. Our eyes are on the outside of our heads, so there's a connection to the external world there. Similarly with hearing, we've literally got holes in our heads that sound can enter. And, and as we've learned more about the brain, we've learned more about how uh, sensory systems work, you know, we've, we've got better and better accounts of, of these systems. Intuition is much more mysterious. We still don't really even know what intuition kind of consists in. Um, presumably it involves some part of the brain, although it's still unclear exactly which part. Maybe various different parts are, have a role in generating intuitions. At any rate, it's certainly not clear how intuition could connect us to the world. So look at it this way. With vision, we have a fact in the world, and information is, uh, is sent to our eyes, which sends information to our brain, and we become conscious of this fact. Uh, we now know that this uh, involves light bouncing off the object, hitting the retina, which sends information down the optic nerve, and so on. But even before modern science, um, you know, people would have probably agreed with this kind of account. With intuition, we don't even have uh, a basic account. There's a fact in the world, uh, say a moral fact, and there's also this event in our heads, the intuition of the moral fact. But how does this fact in the world cause the, the intuition? What's the connection? 
Uh, I don't think anybody really has a clue. So, that is a bit of a problem, and certainly a disanalogy between uh, perception and, and intuition. Third, putting aside these last problems, you know, let's let's grant that moral intuitions are widely shared and that there is a way for for them to connect us up to the world. Even so, nobody has any way of telling if and when intuitions uh, are systematically leading us astray. Th th this uh, this argument is similar to one given by uh, Moti Mizrahi, philosopher. Mizrahi points out that with perception, there are all sorts of bad epistemic circumstances. And when such circumstances obtain, we can't trust what we seem to perceive. For instance, if I take LSD, I won't be able to trust my visual sense impressions. Um, another example would be optical illusions. So, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen those, those optical illusions where there's like two shades of grey and they seem to be different shades of grey, but they're actually exactly the same shade of grey. Um, I like those ones. They're, they're really just, you can't, you can't believe it because they look so different. Um, now notice that with optical illusions, even if you're perfectly sober and you're looking at them in, with good lighting conditions, the illusion is just as strong. The problem is that we don't really have any clue what constitutes good epistemic circumstances for intuitions. What's the best frame of mind to have when considering one's intuitions? Should you sit down with a cool head and spend a lot of time considering them? Or would lots of thought obscure your intuitions? Maybe your intuitions are your sort of immediate pre-reflective judgments. Maybe kind of thinking about them a lot ends up kind of sort of muddying the waters. Can intuition suffer from an analogue of optical illusion? Mizrahi explicitly suggests that there could be what he calls intellectual illusions. There could be circumstances where intuitions are misleading just because of the sort of intrinsic nature of those circumstances, just like how optical illusions are intrinsically misleading. Even if you're totally sober and, you know, thinking clearly, you still get the optical illusion. Similarly, there could just be kind of cases where we, we just get the wrong intuition. We don't know. That's the problem. We do know with perception. So to sum up, all we really know is that we have these intuitions. Uh, it seems to be that other people have different intuitions, we don't have the slightest clue how intuitions connect us up with the world, and even if they do connect us up with the world, we don't know what counts as good circumstances for intuiting. So, we should be very wary of intuitions. Intuitions have more serious problems than perception. So that means that um, uh, this principle of phenomenal conservatism really breaks down in the case of intuition. Finally, I also think it's worth noting that... Um, even kind of, you know, despite the principle of phenomenal conservatism, sometimes we actually might be justified in a, a sort of wholesale rejection, even of some forms of perception. So consider colour. There are some philosophers who've suggested that colours simply don't exist in any sense. Our impressions of colour totally mislead us. Colour is basically one massive illusion. Now, I don't accept this view myself, but it's clearly plausible. Uh, C.L. Hardin suggests this view in his book, Colour for Philosophers. It's a very sophisticated book. But if this is kind of right, if this is just a, you know, even if this is just a plausible view, then it suggests that we can be kind of wholesale misled about, uh, you know, a particular uh, way of knowing the world. So it really wouldn't necessarily be very surprising if we were wholesale misled by our intuitions. So I think that the um, the epistemological problem is uh, is a very serious one for for intuitionism. How we can how how intuitions can can really give us moral knowledge can give us access to moral facts. Gilbert Harmon has uh, an interesting argument from explanatory impotence. Harmon asks us to consider two scenarios. In the first scenario, somebody turns a corner and sees a gang of people setting a cat on fire. Uh, horrified, this person exclaims, that's evil. In the second scenario, a physicist looks into a cloud chamber, sees a vapour trail and says, that's a proton. So we have uh, first, somebody believing that it's wrong to set a cat on fire, and second, somebody believing there's an, a, a proton in the cloud chamber. Now, Harmon asks, how do we explain these beliefs? What's caused these beliefs. Take the scientist. First, we need to attribute 
certain psychological states to the scientist. The scientist accepts a particular physical theory which postulates protons, he assumes that observation conditions are normal, he assumes that his cloud chamber is working normally, and so on. But second, we also need to assume that there really is a proton in the cloud chamber, which really did cause the vapour trail, because this is needed to explain why the vapour trail was there for the scientist to see. If the proton hadn't been there, the vapour trail wouldn't have been there either. Of course, you might point out that other things can cause vapour trails, and maybe there aren't really any protons, and future science will explain vapour trails differently. That's fine. The point here is that the best explanation we have for the scientist's belief at the moment is, first, that the scientist has certain psychological states, and second, that there really is a proton in the cloud chamber. Maybe we'll come up with better explanations in the future. Maybe we'll find out that, uh, that the vapour trail was caused by something else. But that's our best explanation right now. But now think about the moral case. How do we explain the belief that burning the cat is wrong? The best explanation here simply appeals to non-moral physical facts. The action of, uh, of, of lighting a, uh, holding a lighter to the cat, for instance, and psychological facts about the observer, the observer's moral sensibility. We don't need to posit any moral facts. Indeed, if there are any moral facts, they would be irrelevant here, because even if it's a fact that the action is morally wrong, we still need to appeal to the moral sensibility of the observer in order to explain his reaction. Just because something's morally wrong doesn't mean people will morally object to it. They need the right moral sensibility. The observer's moral sensibility is doing all the work here. Look at it in terms of um, necessary and sufficient conditions. Given the physical facts of the action, the psychological facts of the observer are necessary and sufficient for the observer's reaction. Given the physical facts of the action, the moral facts of the action are neither necessary nor sufficient for the observer's reaction. So the moral facts aren't really playing any role here in our explanation. The way Harman sums it up is, uh, he says, the fact that an observation of a physical event was made at the time it was made is evidence not only about the observer, but also about the physical facts. The fact that you made a particular moral observation when you did does not seem to be evidence about moral facts, only evidence about you and your moral sensibility. According to Harman, we just don't need moral properties. They have no useful explanatory role to play. In which case, why posit them at all? Occam's razor can cut them away. Harman's argument, if it's, if it, if it's successful, establishes that moral properties are explanatorily impotent which should lead us to be uh, sceptical of them. It, it clearly undercuts any positive reason we might have for believing in moral properties. A similar argument um, concerns the causal powers of moral properties. Protons have causal powers. They cause vapour trails in cloud chambers, leading people who are sufficiently knowledgeable about the relevant physical theories to come to believe that there are protons in the cloud chamber. What sort of, moral pro what sort of causal powers do moral properties have? Many moral realists suppose that moral properties have uh, causal powers. Uh, I think an example given by Nicholas Sturgeon is that slavery was abolished because growing numbers of people came to realise that it was morally bad. It's just a straightforward appeal to causal power. But if we're moral non-naturalists, how do we explain this causal power? The, the, this argument here was, uh, is inspired by Ye Guan Kim's exclusion problem in the philosophy of mind. In fact, this is pretty much the same argument. Let's um, imagine that there are moral properties, that setting the cat on fire has the non-moral property of wrongness. We can diagram the causal relations between this event and other events. So, um, we have, uh, you know, an, uh, we, what we have is, is an event which could be setting a cat on fire, and this has various natural properties, N1. And the moral property of badness, B, supervenes on it. Then we have N2, which might be an observer's reaction to N1. So we can ask, what causes N2? Now, there are only three options here. First, we can say that N2 is caused by the natural properties of N1. The obvious problem with this is that it makes the moral properties causally impotent. This wouldn't prove non-naturalism wrong, but it would make it very unattractive. It just becomes completely unnecessary to postulate moral properties here. 
Uh, Occam's razor makes quick work of this kind of picture. Just cut the moral properties away. We don't need them. Um, if they have no causal power of their own, you know, why would we bother positing them? What if we say that the moral properties cause it? Well, now we have this problem of, uh, of downward causation. Uh, it's worth emphasising just how radical this position is. A central claim of, of physicalism, or materialism, is that the physical world is causally closed. All physical events have physical causes, or in the language that we're using, all natural events have natural causes. Um, I mean, at least assuming that they have any cause at all. Uh, physicalists would want to allow that there can be uncaused events. But if a natural event has a cause, the cause must be natural too. So if we hold that N2 is caused by B, and not by N1, this is a straightforward denial of physicalism. Perhaps some moral non-naturalists would be happy with this, but I think probably most of them these days wouldn't be happy with that. But even putting this aside, um, it's not clear how we're supposed to interpret what's going on here. The claim is, N2 is caused by B, it's not caused by M1. The trouble is that everybody agrees that moral properties supervene on natural properties. B supervenes on N1. N1 determines B. So if B caused N2, how can it make sense to say that N1 doesn't cause N2? N1 is sufficient for B. Uh, so how can it not be sufficient for N2, given that B causes N2? Um, so that's just a very weird picture. That it's not difficult. It's it's it's, it's difficult to see what sense we can make of that. Finally, third option, we might suggest that both the natural properties and the moral properties cause N2. So we have causal over determination. The problem here is that it's very difficult to see how this kind of over determination is supposed to work. Um, as Yegwon Kim puts it, it looks like N1 does all of the causal work here. There's nothing left for B to do. If we hold that B is necessary for N2, so perhaps there are some properties in N2 that N1 can't alone cause, then obviously this is just a version of the second option. We'd be saying that B has causal powers independent of the properties it supervenes on. So for this to be a distinctive third option, we have to say that N1 alone is sufficient for N2. But now notice an important asymmetry between N1 and B. B is dependent on N1. You can't change moral properties without changing the natural properties. On the other hand, N1 isn't dependent on B. Natural properties, properties can change without moral properties changing. So suppose the event is a group of kids setting fire to a dog. Uh, the natural properties here would be different. Okay, Setting fire to a dog is different to setting fire to a cat. But plausibly, its moral properties would be the same. It would be just as bad. So it's difficult to make sense of this idea that, that B can have any causal power of its own in under this picture uh, at any rate it's you know it's, it's difficult to see why we should postulate this kind of overdetermination again Occam's razor seems to make quick work of this option so whichever way we look at it the non-naturalist is in trouble of course one response to this problem is to say that n1 and b are identical uh, b just is n1 um, you know in the same way that uh, a rectangular shape is identical to the arrangement of the pixels that constitute it. You know, the shape is nothing more than the arrangement of pixels. But obviously this would amount to a denial of non-naturalism. The whole point of moral non-naturalism is that moral properties are something over and above natural properties. They're not reducible to moral pro to, to natural properties. Uh, I guess this, dis this discussion has been a bit technical, but the main point is really quite simple. The question is, which of these accounts of causation is more plausible? Is N2 caused by the natural properties, by the non-natural moral properties, or by both the natural and the non-natural properties? Um, the most plausible account seems to be number one, uh, in which case there's no reason to posit moral properties. Two and three do at least give moral properties a role, but there are other problems with these accounts. So this kind of thing, I think, um, could, could be used to strengthen Harman's attack. Harman's argument casts scepticism on the causal role of moral properties. This argument suggests that we have positive reason to reject the, the idea that moral properties have any causal powers. It's not just scepticism, 
it's it seems very difficult to to fit moral properties into the causal structure of the world which of course suggests that there is you know good reason not to posit them if moral properties have no causal powers then you know we would be inflating our ontology for no clear reason at all um okay then well uh, i think that's probably enough those were some problems for for intuitionism um in the next video we will look at uh, another form of moral realism moral naturalism but you know that's it for today thanks for watching goodbye